Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiter here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a patient who attended with a blocked left ear full of earwax and also this, their right ear, which is full of dried, crusted blood. Um, they un are unsure of the cause of that. They uh, deny using cotton buds or poking inside their ears and therefore the only two plausible explanations are that um, some sort of foreign body flew into the ear, nipped the side of the ear canal, uh, or maybe even an insect bite, but um, and that insect then escaped out of the ear. So they went to see their GP because they had this um, bit of weeping blood from the right ear, and they were advised to visit myself so I can clean that out and see what's going on um, behind that crusted blood, because in case of a perforation to the eardrum, for example. So just removing this occluding wax from the left ear first, it came out relatively easily. It was qu quite a substantial piece, and I managed to manipulate it out of the ear, which is a bit bendy, as you can see here, the second bend, and it, the ear canal then veers off to the left. That's the eardrum, looks really, really healthy. And now we're going to tackle the right ear. So the plan of action is to remove all the outer dried blood first and then we'll approach the eardrum slowly but surely. We just have to be on the lookout for any abnormalities in the ear canal, for example, necrotizing otitis external, which is a very rare condition, but it's when the underlying bone of the ear canal is infected. Uh, it can be quite serious. Um, it's a rare condition, as I mentioned, and um, People who suffer from diabetes or immunocompromised or elderly are more likely to, to get it, um, despite it being a rare condition. It doesn't mean that a normal individual can't get it. And the underlying condition is called osteomyelitis. It's when the bone gets infected, and that infected bone can then spread uh, up to the skull base. It can lead to a brain abscess, meningitis. It, it can be fatal. It can also uh, go up towards the facial nerve, which sits in the middle ear next to the um, stapes foot plate, which is where the, the smallest bone in the body, the stapes, uh, also known as the stirrup, connects to the organ of here in the cochlea. It can go towards the temporomandular jaw joint, so to the front part of the ear canal, and also posteriorly to the mastoid cavity, so the bone behind the ear. Um, typically, however, with uh, necrotizing or external, external, you get a massive granulation tissue, which is inflammatory tissue, which builds up where the bony part of the ear canal meets the, the cartilage portion of the ear canal, so about a third of the way and around a centimetre, give or take. You get a big mass of um, granulation tissue from the floor of the ear canal, um, and there's normally a lot of discharge. I don't think it's, it's that. Underneath here, potentially, you never know, it could be a canal cholesteatoma. So that's when you get ulceration of the skin and the underlying bone it starts to die and decay. So it undergoes a process called necrosis and you get sequestered on bones and loose bone fragments. Again, that can be potentially very, very dangerous, similar to the necrotizing otitis externa. Uh, I don't think it's that, but we don't know. Um, it could also be a condition called B9 osteitis, which is um, it's sometimes difficult to separate from a canal cholesterol but a B9 osteitis is when um, the bone gets infected underneath the skin, but it's it's less severe than necrotizing. It's not spreading, it's more localised. Um, but the skin generally can still be intact or the skin can later become ulcerated. So a B9 osteitis and canal cholesterol you can generally get um, craters within the ear canal they're normally in the inferior posterior quadrant of the ear canal. So what I mean by that is at the back part of the ear canal near the floor. Um, but yeah, B9 osteitis and canal fashion can be difficult to differentiate uh, at times. So, But I think with the canal fashion term, you just know it's a bit more aggressive. It's a lot more discharge there. Whereas a B9 osteitis, sometimes you don't even get discharge. So we're still not sure. And but all I can see here now is the skin is inflamed, it's swollen. And we just want to see what's underneath this blood. That's why it's quite important to remove. Um, now, the patient was elderly. So 
uh, they're non-diabetic they they don't um, take any blood thinners they've got no even no compromised conditions that they're aware of and these things are important um, because if you are diabetic you're you've got less blood flow going to the periphery parts of your bodies including the ears so your immune, your immune system is compromised because when you've got reduction of blood flow it's less able to fight infection provide the body with all the um, right blood cells and nutrients and oxygen it needs to, to help fight an infection so you've got to be careful whenever you've got a diabetic patient um, similar to immunocompromised if the immune system is weakened they're less likely to fight an infection and uh, when you've got someone who's elderly, they, they, they can also become immunocompromised just through age. So these, these three factors are quite important when you remove earwax. And you spot a pathology, it can help with your diagnosis sometimes. So it's really crusted. And I put a lot of drops in. When you've got crusted blood in the ear in particular, especially on the bony part, this is on the cartilage portion, which there was a bit earlier on that I removed. It's far easier to remove, but we're applying pressure against the canal wall which is a very tender and inflamed as you can see and the bony part of the ear canal it can be very unforgiving i don't know if you can see at nine o'clock you can actually see the long process of the incus that's the middle bone also known as the anvil and we see it like a um an inverted l or should i say a, ref a mirror image l so it's flipped horizontally so that's so uh, the the main the hammer bone is the the bone in between the suction probe and the crusted wax on the anterior canal wall. The front parts so are right in the centre of the suction probe and the crusted blood. You see that that's the hammer bone. Uh, the incus bone is actually obscured at the moment by the suction probe, but you don't always see the incus bone, especially in elderly patients, because the eardrum becomes a bit more opaque a bit more tympanoscrotic, so you get a build-up of um, calcium deposits in the eardrum, making it a bit more opaque. It's similar to, it's, you can describe it as scar tissue, if you like. But in this patient, we can see it just about, just, which we know the eardrum is in good, good condition. But again, we, there might be a perforation here that we can't see. Um, it was slightly uncomfortable at times with the patient, unfortunately. It's, and when I removed this um, and held it in between my forefinger and thumb with uh, with the gloves on. Despite all these drops that I put in trying to soften this, it was really razor sharp and it did nick the ear as I removed it with forceps because it was so rough. Uh, eventually I do remove it with forceps, but at the moment I can't use forceps. I can't use any other instrument apart from suction because it's naturally, I, would, I don't know why I have to explain why, but I can't use a hook or a chops and horn where, where in this position where the wax is. Uh, forceps is just nothing to grip onto at the moment so I'm just having to persevere with suction but eventually I manipulate this and there's a lot of this crusted blood in behind that canal wall at the front that's swollen and that region that we're working at the moment is called the anterior recess so you'd be quite surprised by how much of this clotted dry blood is actually hidden away in that anterior recess when you've got a really dry crusted blood or even wax it's much harder to get a suction grip the tip of the sucker almost glides across the surface and it doesn't grip because it's so rough and dry hence why i put loads of drops and i'm actually there i was and again the drops are still in situ i'm performing the procedure whilst the drops is in there i've allowed it five minutes to rest if not longer as well I've just bent the tip of the suction probe because we don't want to make contact with the front part of the ear canal, which is, as you can see, it's very bruised. So I'm quite confident there's no, uh, those pathologies that I mentioned earlier, there's no benign osteitis, canal cleschiotoma. Uh, this is not keratosis obtrans. There's no necrotizing otitis externa, so... Still not entirely sure what's caused the bleeding there. So probably the bets are at the moment there'd be an underlying perforation behind this, but um, there wasn't. So, so as I said, I, I suspect if the patient hasn't been poking there and they were quite adamant and they haven't, 
um, either from particle body had flown into the ear, nicked the side of the ear canal. Sometimes patients can unknowingly scratch inside their ear, especially at night. It happens a lot, actually. And they're completely oblivious to it. I had a couple once where the patient's partner brought in a video that they took at night of their partner scratching the ear and the patient just wasn't aware. So they're doing it in their sleep. But I, I doubt that even if that... I just don't think that was the case in this in this particular patient because this is so deep in the ear. It's about between two and a half, three centimetres into the ear and it just they've got a narrow bend ear. They just wouldn't be able to get their finger in that deep. So I got a bit... Um, up, uh, I was going to say excited or I'm trying to think of one for the better word there, but because I brought it forwards, but it just still wasn't powerful enough to, to remove. But you can see I've somewhat lifted it off the front part of the ear canal. My worry is, and it did happen, that I'm pushing it, I pushed it further back in and I positioned it back into that anterior recess, which is what we don't want. I'm trying to lift it up, but because of that swelling anteriorly, it's blocking the path for this crusted blood to come away. See, I'm trying to bring it from right to left on screen. So I'm trying to curl it around the front part of the ear canal, but it's actually a lot larger than I, than I initially thought. It's difficult squeezing it through. And then you can see the edges. So there's a bit... Um, about eight o'clock, that's just resting against the, the left hand side of the, the floor of the ear canal. And I think that was the part that when I removed this, because it was so sharp, that it nicked the side of that part of the ear canal. So there was a bit of ble ex bleeding that occurred after this procedure, unfortunately. And see the difficulty we're having at the roof of the ear canal. That crust of blood is also getting, it's captured at the roof. You can see there where I'm focused in on a moment ago. So that's trapped it. So I've just put loads of more drops in and it has softened that top part and it's come down a bit. Now I've had a bit there to grab onto and I pulled this forwards. I had to release because the patient found it a bit uncomfortable. But fortunately, I managed to bring it through and it's just between the first and second bend now. So I'm going to go back to the suction probe and vacuum this out. And then there's just a little bit left there. But you can see there's some fresh blood developing. And I suspect it's because it just nicked that, the back part of the ear canal. You see there's a bit of a blister forming there. So I'm just going to suction it. I'm going to try and just stem that bleeding. It's a bit deep to put anything inside to kind of compress that. But by the end, um, the bleeding stopped. I did a pressure test just to check, make sure there's no perforation, which there wasn't, which is great. And I was just worried about that pond of the blood collecting and forming into another crusted uh, piece of dry blood. So I have got the patient coming back, I think, next week, just as a precautionary measure, just to make sure there's no fresh crusted blood but by the, by the time they left this has stopped bleeding more or less so that's the inferior recess and you can get blood collecting there quite easily you can see there's no perforation here it was very healthy in fact I think by removing that crusted blood the eardrums come forwards and it's it's flexed laterally a bit towards me. Just gently, I don't want to make contact at all with any of the the flesh, the skin or the canal wall or the eardrum at all. I just want to hover over. I'm just trying to help this blood coagulate. And any excess blood before it kind of drizzles down to the inferior recess. The inferior recess can be very difficult to remove objects out of. So this is about a couple of minutes afterwards. And see there's some blood just trickling down towards me. It's 
a little bit left also a little bit has also again collected in the inferior recess i'm just going to mop that up seems as it's beginning to coagulate there Patient was very relieved because they were a bit concerned actually when they were told by their doctor that they've got some dry crusted blood naturally. I think anyone, any of us would be a bit concerned as to the cause of the. But it doesn't look anything sinister here. And this is again about three or four minutes later. Um, whilst I was booking the patient in for their follow-up, just to, just a quick checkup. So in that time, just a little bit collected, but you can see it's really stemmed now, so, which is good. I think this was just before the end of the appointment, I just had one quick look again. They had a bit more collected in the inferior recess on that occasion, but so I did advise the patients to do get any trickling of blood at night, do not be concerned. But obviously, if it's bleeding a lot, call us back, um, we'll get them in an emergency. But everything looks fine, so we'll re examine that and hopefully, I'll upload any interesting observations. I think the patient's going to be fine. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care. Keep well and speak soon. Bye.